it feels as if we are watching our nation unravel at the seams, like literally a meltdown. And while people are pointing fingers and exchanging blame, the Holy Spirit keeps pointing my heart to what will feel like an all too simple solution in the face of the complexities of the challenges we are in in this moment. But there is power in the simplicity of what we're going to talk about today. Now, let me just illustrate that with a story. In 2008, I went to South Africa for the first time. So you, you know, we have a campus in South Africa now in the southern part of the nation, but I was actually visiting uh, more in the north central part of the nation. I flew into Jay, uh, Jayburg, uh, Johannesburg, Pretoria area, uh, preaching in a church I'd never been in for a pastor I'd never met. I was actually connected through a mutual friend. I knew a little bit about South Africa. Uh, I knew a little bit about apartheid. I knew a little bit about Nelson Mandela. I knew a lot about the racial division. I knew that their apartheid was a lot more recent than our civil rights movement. But I, I didn't know all that I should have known. I really went into South Africa naive. And I think God used the naivety and he used the innocence to do something. But I preached that Sunday morning. It was a predominantly all-white church. Um, oh, it was an all-white church made up of Dutch Reformed people um, and some charismatics. Uh, and I preached that Sunday morning. I gave my testimony uh, of abuse and brokenness. And God really worked in the hearts of people. That Sunday night, I just really felt like he wanted me to walk, walk verse by verse through 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And, and I, I hadn't thought about this story in a long time. And the Lord really directed me there for our time together today. And I guess in my preparation to preach from 1 Corinthians 13, I thought about this moment in South Africa where I was walking through a teaching on 1 Corinthians 13 verse by verse. As I got to the end, there are only 13 verses there, as I got to the end of the 13th chapter, uh, I, I heard this wailing noise. The, there was a center aisle in the building and there was a man on the very back row sitting on the aisle uh, who started wailing as I was trying to apply the word and get ready for a response time. Uh, and he, he got on his hands and knees and started slowly walking on his hands and knees while everyone else is still seated and quiet. And this shrill wail and weeping as he starts walking on his hands and knees toward the front of the building. Now, I'm a guest in a new church, uh, in an entirely new culture, a country I've only been in less than 48 hours. I know very little about it. I didn't know what to do, so I, I turned to the pastor who was near the front, and he was already making his way to the platform. He had looked back, seen the man, was coming back up to help me, <laughs> and uh, he put his arm around me, and with this real sense of burden, he said to me, thank you. And then he grabbed the microphone and started speaking in Afrikaans, which is this kind of unique mixture of Dutch, German, it feels like, but it's its own language. And, and I didn't know what was happening, but the man continued to walk when he got to, uh, on his hands and knees. When he got to the front, he laid over a, a bench, an altar there, and just wept and sobbed. Other men in the church came. The pastor stepped off the platform to join him and other people in the church began to wail and repent and, and literally cry out loudly to God, repenting. I didn't know what all had just happened. After it was over, the pastor came to me and said, the man that started all of that was so pricked in his heart by the word about the love of God that it drove him to his knees, literally. He said, Brian, that man is one of the most prominent white supremacists in this nation. He comes to church every weekend, but there is evil in his heart. And today, something broke in his life and in this church that will change him and change us forever. Now, now don't be tempted to call me courageous, because I had no idea that kind of evil was lurking in the heart of that man or in that church. I was naive. And God used the naivety in a 34-year-old life at the time and then used the simplicity of his love and the power of the gospel to begin uprooting generations of hate and racism and prejudice. There I saw the transformative power of the gospel through the preached word and the simplicity of the message of the love of God. The love of God is the most powerful force in heaven 
and on earth. It melts the hardness of human hearts. And it is my prayer today that every one of us in our own way would encounter the transformational power of the love of God. Now before we start walking through 1 Corinthians 13, I actually want you to turn with me to chapter 12. I want to start there, so find your place there. And while you do that, let me just recommend a couple resources that have been beneficial to me for years, some more recently, that will help you navigate maybe the season that we're living in. I, I wrote a post on social media. I'm not a very outspoken, so I'm not a social media influencer. Really, I only use social media to, uh, to promote events going on in the church. But I just felt I, I was up, burdened, and I guess I said in the post I was grieving, and I, 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 based on the response, it seems like the, what I put into words was really a reflection of what a lot of people were feeling in their hearts. So if you, if you need help uh, in some way uh, trying to express the emotions in your heart right now, uh, find that post, one of my pages on social media and uh, Facebook pages, and just let it, maybe it'll help you. I know it helped a lot of other people about grief in the season of our nation's brokenness. Um, Another thing I would encourage you to do, at the end of this last week, I I did an early morning interview with four black men who are dear friends of mine. I mean, each of them, from senior adults all the way to young adults and in between, each of them have interacted in my life at different times, have helped me. As iron sharpens iron, they have exposed the blind spots in my own life and walked me through, not just this season, but life for years. Some of them for over 20 years and longer. And so I just invited them into a conversation. I believe that conversation will be helpful to you. Um, Wherever you are watching this, it will be a video option. There will be some audio options in our North Place podcast. But just be looking for that interview. Um, You'll find that it should be available already for you. Um, A couple other things I want to make available, and then I'll go on. I'll just make you aware of. Uh, One of the greatest books I ever read that addresses what's going on in our country right now is The Third Option by Miles McPherson. Haley and I were in a gathering, a a small gathering of pastors in Southern California late February before all this stuff broke out. Uh, Miles was there as one of the facilitators. He gave us a book uh, and I started reading it immediately. He's a pastor, but he sounds like a sociologist as he goes through this book. Incredibly theologically sound, practical principles to help us. We have these things, we pick sides. It's either us or them. And he says there's a third option, and it's laid out in Scripture. And I would encourage you, if you haven't, to pick that up. Another one written by a really good friend of mine, uh, Alex Bryan and his wife Angela. Let's start again. So if you're just looking for things to help that are biblically sound, written by people that are trustworthy, uh, I would encourage you, take an opportunity to engage that material. Now, let's get back to what I said, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to start there in just a moment. In that entirety of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, Paul is basically speaking and introducing us to the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, some of you are very familiar with that. For many of you, you grew up in segments of the church that never even addressed this, didn't even talk about this. But this is here, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul introduces to us nine, what are known as nine gifts of the Spirit, the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit. And they are this, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, gifts of healing, miracles, prophecy, discernment of of spirits or distinguishing between spirits, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. There are nine of them. Spends the entirety of the chapter talking, introducing them to us. That's chapter 12. Chapter 14, he then begins to talk about the public operation of those gifts when there are believers together for public worship. This is the practical way it ought to look. This is how it ought to operate. So that's chapter 14. Introduction, chapter 12, explanation of public use in chapter 14. Well, we know forever that chapter 13 is the love chapter. So it seems like the love chapter is out of place. The chapter 12 and the chapter 14 is the same conversation. So chapter 13 about love seems like it's an out of place conversation. So why would Paul interrupt the flow of a conversation to put right in the middle this talk? He's talked about the gifts of the Spirit, and now in the middle of the two parts, he's going to talk about love. Why would he chop that up? Unless love is an intentional part of this conversation. And I will tell you, the placement of chapter 13, not just what he says, but where he puts it, is a theological statement. It is theologically significant. 
Paul's point is this, the love of God, the purity of God, the presence of God in our lives is the prerequisite and foundation for the power of God in our lives. Love is his power. So chapter 13 is the hinge on which chapter 12 and chapter 14 swing. The door of chapter 12 and 14 about the gifts of the Spirit cannot even hold up if they are not hung on the hinge of love, chapter 13. If love for God and love for people is not the motivation of the gifts in your life, then they are meaningless. And if our lives are not filled and consumed by the love of God, then Paul basically says in chapter 13, we are spiritually powerless and spiritually dead. Now, Paul is not belittling the gifts at all in this conversation. He is actually celebrating them. As a matter of fact, that's why I wanted you to start in the last verse of chapter 12 where Paul says this, but earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. Now, earnestly desire. In the King James, that word is covet. Covet is a strong word, most often used for sin. Because if it's not the right thing you're coveting, it becomes sinful. But Paul actually says, covet the gifts. Long for them, want them, desire them. But I want to show you something that is even better. I grew up in a, an environment, I guess Southern Pentecostalism is the only way I know how to describe it. A very expressive and demonstrative environment in its worship experience. And I can tell you we are the ones... Uh, a lot of the churches I was affiliated with in my growing up years, we're the ones that gave the holy rollers. We, we put the roller in holy roller. People shouted when they worshiped. They danced in the aisles when they worshiped. Uh, it wasn't uncommon to see somebody jump something and run the aisle in the excitement in their worship. People prayed in tongues out loud. They, they, they laid hands on the sick and prayed for healing. There was the expectation for prayer for miracles in every service. And the wilder it got the more we walked out that day saying we had church today. The Corinthian church experience was a lot like the church experience that I grew up around. They were well-versed in the expression of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and they prided themselves in their public religious expression. They were prophesying, they were speaking in tongues, they were very good at their public religious performance. But outside the church, and we know this from reading Paul's two letters to them, outside the church they were sleeping around and even getting drunk at communion services. So Paul is writing to them to offer them a very pastoral, gracious, but direct rebuke. He tells them, it does not matter. How spiritual you look in a public worship service. If you can't live right when you walk out the door. If you can't walk in personal integrity and character when nobody else is looking. Then the demonstration of your public gift means absolutely nothing to God. Our performance, our generosity, our devotion is empty without love. My grandfather was a pastor, and if I've heard him once, I've heard him say it a hundred times. He used to tell his people all the time, I don't care how high you jump in worship, all that matters is how your feet walk when they hit the ground. That's kind of the point Paul was trying to make. There are 13 verses in chapter 13. They logically kind of fall into three divisions, and I want us to look at the first of those three divisions in the first three verses, and I really believe Paul is trying to teach us first about the preeminence of love. For something to be preeminent, that means it is supreme, it is above, it is higher than, it supersedes everything else. So the apostle is trying to remind the Corinthian church that the love of God is the most important thing that should be gaining their focus. They shouldn't be focusing on anything else more than they are on the love of God. These people were out of balance, priding themselves in the power of their public performance, but overlooking the most important power that they should be demonstrating, the love of God. Paul makes this plain in the first three verses when he compares, he uses five of the gifts just as an example of all nine. There are nine, but he only uses five as an example. And he compares the gifts to the love of God. Listen to what he says, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. 
If I speak in the tongues of men or angels, that's the gift of tongues, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, there's a second one. Or can fathom all mysteries, that is the gift of discernment, and all knowledge, that's word of knowledge, and have faith, the gift of faith, that I can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Okay, so you can have all these gifts at work in your life, but it literally is going to profit you nothing. In other words, let me put in today's terminology. You could have a ministry that travels the world. You could be known for demonstrations of supernatural power. You could be incredibly gifted and talented for public performance. You could sing, you could speak, you could play an instrument, whatever. You might be able to light up a room with your charismatic personality. But behind the scenes... If the love of God, the righteousness of God, the purity of God does not mark your life in private, Paul says your public demonstration is nothing but an annoying noise in the ear of God. Matter of fact, he calls it a sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Listen, it doesn't matter how many 1 Corinthians 12 gifts of the Spirit are operational in your life. If your Galatians 5.22 fruit of the Spirit isn't like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, uh, self-control. If those things are not evident in your life, if you're pursuing the gift but not bearing the fruit, Paul says, you're just making a whole lot of noise. It's amazing how adamant Paul is about making this point because he uses two really extreme examples to further the conversation in verse 3. Listen, he says this, If I give away all I have and I deliver my body to be burned, like being burned at the stake as a martyr, but have not love, I gain nothing. Paul exposes the motive of religious hearts here because he says someone could express so much generosity that they literally give everything they have to the poor, or they could be so committed to their faith that they are willing to die for it, they become a martyr for the cause, and do all of that. Give everything away, die for the cause as a martyr, and do it all without the presence of the love of God in their heart. Sometimes religion is motivated by other things other than the love of God. And we will end this thing without God's love and literally gain nothing before Him. We'll just be noise, sounding gongs and clanging cymbals. And I don't know about you, but when I read this and when I think about it deeply, it's scary to me. It's a somber reality to me that I can do all the right things for all the wrong reasons and come to the end of my life and have done it for nothing. That, that you can have, this is what's scary to me, that you can have the anointing of God without the approval of God. I realized this years ago when I saw people who started out pure in ministry, right hearts, right motives. But then over the time I watched them start to drift privately in their convictions and their commitments. And those small compromises started becoming big sins. But they kept up their public ministry performance. And every time they would step out on a stage, knowing they weren't living right, they would step out on a stage anyway, and they would get out there, and they would feel the presence of God. There would be an anointing on His Word, and they would feel that anointing, and they would rationalize their poor choices as if because I feel God's presence when I'm on the stage, or because I feel God's anointing when I minister, God must be okay with my sin. And it would reinforce their bad behavior. Listen, don't assume that just because you feel His anointing that you have His approval. It is why I have prayed my whole life that I would, I would crave, literally, the approval of God over the anointing of God. His private presence, His blessing should be more important than any, to any of us than the applause of men or anointing for public ministry. It makes me want to search my heart today and say, Lord, teach me about the preeminence of your love. Teach me that public performance and outward manifestation is a whole lot less important to you than my inward holiness and my love walk. Donald Stamps was a great missionary who wrote the commentary to the Full Life Study Bible, also known as the Fire Bible. And in some of those study notes, he made this statement. Those whose lives are filled with religious activities 
are not necessarily approved by God. In fact, they may not be believers at all. For example, those who speak in tongues or prophesy or have great knowledge or achieve great works of faith, yet at the same time lack Christian love and righteousness are nothing in God's sight. In God's judgment, their spirituality is empty and they have no real place in His kingdom. Now that sounds harsh, but Jesus said exactly the same thing. Jesus affirmed Donald Stamp's statements in Matthew chapter number 7. Let me just say this. Jesus is often quoted as a revolutionary. He was. He's often quoted as somebody who proposed love, and he was. But you can't just pick and choose what part of what Jesus said you want to listen to. If he's going to be who you lean on and you listen to, you've got to live, listen to the tough stuff he said too. So listen to what he said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. To put it in today's terms, they would be arguing with him saying, but Lord, on judgment day, but Lord, I pastored a great church, but Lord, I volunteered every time the doors were open, but Lord, I, I served on the board, but Lord, we went to the homeless shelter every weekend, but Lord, we prayed and actually saw miracles, and in the end, all of that could be true, and him look at me and say, I don't know who you are. And it makes me want to say, dear God, check my heart. Check my motives. That I am not in love with God at all, but I'm in love with the religion that I've made of my own creating. Help me be in love with God. And be filled with the love of God that makes me love people. It's not about my religious activity. It's not about my public performance. It's not about gifts that are operational in my life. It's about my character. It's about my integrity. It's about the purity of my private life, the depth and the sincerity of my relationship with Jesus, my love for Jesus that makes me love people so that His love is flowing through my life. The love of God is preeminent above everything. And then as you get to chapter or verse 4 of chapter 13, you see the second logical division where Paul moves from the preeminence of love. He starts talking about the power of love. Now there's a list here, starting in verse number 4, that speaks to everything love is not. But if you'll read it honestly, everything that love is not is everything that I am or that I'm inclined to be. Listen to verse 4. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. So basically... When it says it does not demand its own way, it's not selfish. It's not irritable. It means it doesn't have a short temper. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong. It means it doesn't hold grudges. Verse 6, it does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whether the truth wins out, whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. Love never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. And can it be any clearer That an awakening of the love of God in our hearts is what we all need right now. It's amazing to me that all of us born of Adam, fallen flesh, are inclined to the very things Paul says love is not. He says we are inclined to be proud and jealous and selfish and short-tempered and rude and unkind, unjust. Paul says everything we are in our sinful nature Love is not. This is why I'm saying Paul is addressing the power of the love of God here. Because what he's saying is love doesn't do those things. Love is not those things. And the power of God's love present in our life can uproot and stamp out those sinful things in our life. God's love can overpower pride and prejudice and my my lack of justice in my life. It can overpower my impatience and my resentment and my short temper, my envy and jealousy. If those things are obvious in my life, it means I have not allowed the love of God to invade it fully. 
But if I open my heart to the empowerment of God's love, His love has a greater positive power in my life than sin has negative power and influence in my life. His love will cast out, uproot, and break the hold of these sinful tendencies in our lives. Which means that somebody genuinely filled with the love of God will not consistently walk in these sinful traits. I know what you're saying. I can already hear it. Even though nobody's in this building, I hear it. But pastor, Christians are not perfect. No, we're not. But I really believe many Christian people have played that imperfect card so long, it has become a really tired excuse. Because most of the time when Christians play the imperfect card, we're not perfect people, I'm a sinner saved by grace, all all that's true. But most of the time when Christians are playing the imperfect card, they're using it as an excuse to continue walking in spiritual immaturity because they don't want to grow up mature and deal with the sin in their life. No, we're not perfect, but we're supposed to be moving closer and closer every day in the process of sanctification into more maturity and perfection in Christ that will not be totally perfect until we see Him face to face. But there ought to be a gradual increase in spiritual maturity as more and more of God's love consumes our life. I know there's a tug of war that rages on the inside of every one of us. We have the desire to please Christ pulling us one way. We have the the, the tendencies of our sinful nature pulling us another way. And the purpose Paul is writing in these few verses is that the power of God's love is greater than this pull towards my sinful nature. It's more powerful than my revenge. It's more powerful than my hate. It's more powerful than my pride. It's more powerful than my boasting and unkindness. We need to be empowered by the love of God to fight the tug of the sinful nature and get this stuff out of our hearts. Listen to the Apostle John. He makes a really strong point. 1 John chapter number 3, verse 14. He says this, If we love our brothers and sisters who are believers, it proves, notice that word proof, it proves that we have passed from death to life. But a person who has no love is still dead. Anyone who hates another brother or sister is really a murderer at heart. And you know that murderers don't have eternal life within them. Listen, the litmus test. The proving ground, the proof for the genuineness of your relationship with Jesus is love. We know that we have passed from spiritual death to spiritual life because we love. If we don't love, we are spiritually dead. And let me just leave this right here. The word brother and sister from 1 John 3 is not a reference to people who look like you, agree with you, And share the same opinions about everything as you. It's a reference to followers of Jesus of every kindred, every tongue, every tribe, and every nation. There is absolutely no room in the heart of a follower of Jesus for prejudice of any kind. But a lot of religious people carry on with their public religious lives while sins like revenge and hate and prejudice or whatever, are lurking underneath the shadows of their heart. And they're lying to themselves and lying to everybody else. But Paul makes it clear in chapter 13 that worship, that our generosity, that our religious performance, if it is without love, is nothing but an annoying noise in the ear of God. Gongs and cymbals. Without God's love, we are spiritually dead and spiritually powerless. We are nothing but Pharisees that Jesus called whitewashed sepulchers. You know what a sepulcher were? It was a headstone. Sepulchers were headstones. So when Jesus called the Pharisees whitewashed sepulchers, he's saying, you got a shiny headstone, but all you are is a marker. Your religious service is nothing but a, a marker above the ground where rot, decay, and death is happening. You're a spiritual dead man. That's what he called the Pharisees. And that's what all of us are without the love of God present in our lives. Here's what I've learned in my 46 years of life. Sometimes the deepest prejudice is found among some of the most religious people. I'll kind of wind this down by telling you a story. I uh, I was a 19-year-old college freshman, met a guy named Michael. Um, His young African-American 
uh, brother, we, his nickname was Mookie. Uh, Michael traveled. Uh, we we kind of formed a team, and he and I traveled across the country singing and preaching together uh, in our early time at seminary, and it was just uh, developed an incredible friendship and, uh, and, and really did well in our teaming up in ministry together. It was before I was married, and um, Michael was single, and, and we just were able to go all over and minister. And I remember getting an invitation to come back and preach at one of the churches I started out preaching in. And I, I love preaching in this church, not far from my hometown. One of the first sermons I ever preached was in this church. I preached a lot of times in this church. The church was in the middle of nowhere. Matter of fact, they were down what is known as Million Dollar Road. <laughs> Uh, and, and I say it's about seven miles of nothing but gravel and dirt. And the reason they call it Million Dollar Road, it did a million dollar worth of damage to your car just to get to the church. It was literally in the middle of nowhere. But I loved going there. They let me preach uh, when I was a teenage kid. But, but these people were expressive in their worship. They would, I didn't have to say anything profound. All I have to do is get up and say, Mary had a little lamb. And they'd start jumping and shouting and saying, yes, he did. He was, uh, she did. He was born in Bethlehem. I mean, they, it didn't take anything to get these people stirred up. I mean, literally. Holy rollers, chandeliers swinging, crazy. Some of you people that think North Place is expressive, we just need to get on a bus <laughs> and let me take you to some places I grew up in. And you would think we are very, very much reserved as a people. These were good people, so I thought. And I think some of them were just ignorant. And I found out some of them were just I- ignorant in race relations. They, they, they didn't mean to have bad hearts. They just didn't realize the prejudice that was lurking below the surface. It all was exposed when I um, tried to bring Michael there to sing. I was talking to the pastor and uh, telling him I met a friend in college and we've been traveling and singing together. He was so excited. We're nailing, about, nailing down the details, details of these several days of meetings. Uh, and uh, somewhere in the course of the conversation, I'm going to say, I, I told him, you just, my black brother can sing. You're going to, and, and I noticed he got quiet, got a little different. And uh, I started pushing a little bit against that. I, I realized, and then he came back and started a little bit at the end. It, basically, what did you say about Michael Bryan? I mean, what do you mean? He's a great singer. No, no, what, is he white? I'm like, no. I said he's a black brother. It was obvious that it bothered that pastor. And he did not want to create a ruckus in his church. And I just told him, I said, look, if Michael isn't welcome in your church, then neither am I pastor tried to convince me to come on by myself. I refused. Uh, He canceled the revival. And I'm just going to tell you, it was one of the eye-opening experiences of my life. I was, I I thought that was over. I thought it was naive. And I thought these were godly people. I mean, you're talking about pew jumping, aisle running, tongue talking. I mean, holiness Pentecostal people. I just couldn't imagine. It just, it didn't reconcile for me. And what even bothered me the most is that the last time I was there, they were one of those churches that had a volunteer choir. You know, anybody want to sing? Come up on the platform. What do we want to sing tonight? And, you know, they just organically start singing. The last time I was there, they sang the song, Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. You know what? You know what one of the verses in that song said? It makes me love everybody. (laughs) Yeah. As long as everybody lives in your neighborhood and looks like you and believes like you. Look. I'm just glad God's everybody is bigger than their everybody. It's proof to me that some of the most religious people have some of the most evil sins lurking in the corridors of their heart. And my prayer today is not to point a finger at anybody else, but say, God, don't let me be blinded by my own religion. Expose my own heart. Fill me with the love of God. Listen, 1 John 4.20 says, If someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? You cannot love. It's impossible for you to love a God you've never seen if you can't love somebody here in the flesh that you can put your eyes on. John says, impossible. And love is the litmus test of a genuine relationship with Jesus. All right, let me leave you with this. The third division of the text I'm not going to have time to unpack today is the preeminence of uh, the permanence of love. So we talked about the preeminence of love, the power of love, and then Paul closes chapter 13 talking about the permanence of love. There's so much richness here. It could be its own sermon. Here's a quick summary. 
The the Corinthians had focused all their attention on their public performance and the power of the gifts of the Holy Spirit to the neglect of their private lives. When Paul gets to this section, he is challenging them to focus on something that is going to last forever. There will come a time when the gifts will cease. Now, our church doesn't believe that's happened yet. We are not cessationists. We are continuationists. We understand a time frame that Paul gives that I don't have time to unpack here. But there will come a time when that time approaches when the gifts will cease. And so Paul is saying to the Corinthian church, why are you so caught up in something that has an expiration date? When you can be focusing on something that is going to last forever. Love. Here are two verses from this last section. Verse 8. Prophecy and speaking in tongues, unknown languages... And special knowledge will become useless. But love will last forever. Verse 13, three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. The permanence of love. Pursue and invest your life in something that is eternal. It concerns me. That I could preach the gospel every weekend. I could give all that I own to the poor. I could offer my life as a martyr and stand before God on judgment day. And it literally profit me nothing because I've lived a loveless and powerless life. That's sobering and surreal to me. So why not pray, fill me with your love, O God. Our culture puts so much emphasis on public Power, public and power. But Paul is making sure we understand that the preeminent and permanent power of love, which is active in our private life and expressed publicly, is greater than any of the modern forms of public power. The culture emphasizes public power. The Lord longs for our private purity that is sustained and empowered by His love. That's fleshed out in our relationships with other people. So, deal with that grudge with the love of God. Deal with your quick temper with the love of God. Deal with the pride. Deal with the prejudice. Deal with whatever through a fresh baptism of the love of God. When we, I'm going to bless you and pray over you in just a moment. And we're going to sing a song. It's so old, some of you won't ever recognize it. Some of you that are more aged or grew up in a church that maybe sang old hymns, you'll recognize this. In 1917, Frederick Lehman wrote what became a classic hymn entitled, The Love of God. Lehman had been a successful businessman, Pasadena, California. He lost everything in some bad business deals and found himself packing oranges in a packing plant. He lost everything, uh, trying to rebuild his life, He attends church one Sunday and is so overcome by the message on the love of God that he starts writing a song at home that night. He can't sleep, couldn't sleep all night. He gets to the packing plant and starts writing what are lyrics to the hymn, the love of God, on scrap pieces of paper and even wrote some on the wooden pallets there in the packing plant. That night he got home and he started putting music and melody to the words that he had written, but he was missing a third verse. The first two verses came quickly, but the third verse never came. And then he remembered he had a bookmark with a poem on it. Somebody had given him the bookmark with a poem. And the poem that was written on that bookmark fit the melody he had written perfectly. And that poem became the third verse to the well-known hymn of the love of God. And here's what was written on that bookmark about that third verse. These words were found written in a cell wall in prison some 200 years ago, prior to 1970. It is not known why the prisoner was incarcerated, neither is it known if the words were original or if he had heard them somewhere and had decided to put them in a place where he could be reminded of the greatness of God's love. Whatever the circumstances, he wrote them on the wall of his prison cell. In due time, he died. And the men who had the job of repainting his cell were impressed by the words. Before their paint brushed had obliterated them, one of the men jotted the words down and preserved them. 
They were on that bookmark and made it into this hymn. The hymn says this, these are Lehman's words. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care, Adam and Eve. He gave his son to win, an erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. O love of God, how rich and pure, how powerless and strong, it shall forevermore endure. The saints, an angel song. Here is the poem that is the third verse of the love of God. It's the most beautiful verse to me in any hymn. Could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. I think what God is trying to do today is to bring Christian people to the refiner's fire and allow the fire of the Holy Spirit and the love of God to purge the impurities out of our lives. Revival of any kind is going to start in us. The inward search of the Holy Spirit in us. So let me pray for you. Father, you said in your word that judgment must first begin at the house of God. So would you search us today, your people, your church. Make us more like you. Let us long for your approval more than your anointing on our public performance. Let us long for character, integrity, righteousness, and purity. May the empowerment of the love of God change us and change the way we interact with people. Father, I pray that you would bless them and keep them. You would make your face shine down upon them, that you would be gracious to them. Turn your countenance, their direction, and give them peace. And Lord, Fill us all with the power of your love. In Jesus' name.